Hello, we're back again with another lecture. This one is about the British and the, the British Luciferian conspiracy. Now, what we have uh, was a continuation of last time. So let me just preface again by saying I'm not really making any factual claims here. These are my religious beliefs and they are protected by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I can have religious freedom to declare my religious beliefs openly. I'm not an expert on anything. These are just my opinions, and so I'm allowed to state them, and I'm going to do that. So let's continue with this question of how did England become the con leader of the Luciferian conspiracy? We want to look at John Dee. Uh, you might not have ever heard of John Dee, but he's very important. He was alive from uh, 1500s to the early 1600s. This is a book that I bought and I've been reading, and it's extremely helpful for connecting some of these dots. And it's John Dee and the Empire of Angels, Enochian Magic and the Occult Roots of the Modern World. It's a big mouthful, but if you think about it, this is actually exactly what we want to be looking at, except if you say Enochian Magic here, it's really more Zohar uh, Kabbalah. It's just called Enochian Magic to make it sound fancier. Um, so it is about the occult roots of the modern world. It does a good job of explaining that influence. I would even recommend this to anyone curious about this subject. But let's continue. So John Dee changed the world by convincing the British monarchy to pursue Zohar-inspired prophetic ambitions and rule the world through dark science in the time when the Jesuits were a rising world power. Uh, Britain was not on a trajectory to be a British empire or to be a world power when John Dee was on the scene. Um, during the time of Bloody Mary and Queen Elizabeth, it took a lot to convince them to actually go and try to conquer North America, for example, and set up those British colonies out there that led to America. So let's start with a question about John Dee's origin. Who taught John Dee about mysticism? John Dee's personal mentor was a guy, I'm not going to pronounce his name right, but Guillaume Postel. Okay, so Postel is his name. Uh, he was a Zohar believer who idolized Hebrew as the sacred language of God. You know, back, back in these days, in the, um, in the early, like mid-1500s to early 1600s, really in the middle of the 1500s, when 1540s, when the Jesuits were founded, uh, around this time, international travel was very easy if you had money. There was no such thing as like nowadays where there's all these checks and stops and everything. It's just if you had money, if you were a noble or an academic, you would go stay here, you'd go stay there. Europe was, there was conflicts going on between Protestants and Catholics and things, but it wasn't a controlled Europe. There was a very loose kind of government overall. So you had a lot of intellectuals traveling between France and Spain and England and Germany and all these different kingdoms and places. And, uh, so it's not surprising that you have French and English people mixing together with the Jewish mysticism, the Zohar, and they're all trying to share secrets and talk to each other, learn things, because uh, the Reformation sort of opened up this door to being able to talk about more things since the Catholic Church wasn't in full control and the Inquisition wasn't as big of a threat because you had Protestant countries where you could be safe from them. So, uh, John Dee's mentor was one of these people who traveled around and he learned about uh, the Zohar. He learned about Kabbalah. And, of course, that's Luciferianism in disguise. And so, he learned Luciferianism right there. He thought that Hebrew was the sacred language. And he believed that he could unite Catholics, Protestants, Jews, and Muslims with a new world religion something that would transcend all of them. Uh, that's part of the Luciferian thing, is that 
all religions have to go away. And then obviously Lucifer, the light bringer, uh, Satan can go and take all of them and give them this enlightenment, this Los Alumbrados education that they wake up from their traditional religions and they start worshiping this mysticism and that's the occult. So um, Postel worshiped a prophetess named Mother Zuwana who claimed to be the incarnation of the Shekinah. Shekinah is the uh, occult lie, the idea that God has a female half that you never hear about. Um, nowadays, it's also called the Holy Spirit in New Age circles. They just use the term Holy Spirit to refer to. When you actually question them about it, they'll tell you it's the Shekinah, it's this glory, it's this female half. They really, really, really want to convince you that the best part of God is this female part, so that they can worship a female goddess. And Mother Zuana believed that she was an incarnation of this Shekinah spirit of God. Very Los Alumbrados. Um, so most likely, this Mother Zuana, that's a pretty fancy foreign sounding name for to be in, in England or wherever Postel met her. Um, called herself a prophetess. Well, this is again what we saw in Revelation or in in the New Testament already with the Jezebel, um, the synagogue of Satan, this false apostles of light, Satan convincing people that he is an angel of light. So John Dee's mentor is a crazy person who's into the occult, believes in uh, Jewish mysticism, a prophetess, who thinks that she's part of God as an incarnation of the Shekinah. This is this is what it's like back then. I mean, anything went back here. This is before science. This is in an age of superstition and uh, mysticism really on the rise. Um, even though they claim to be more scientific and more academic, they studied the occult in a scientific way. That's kind of the way that the shift that happened. Instead of just being a a folk superstition, like you believe that on a full moon you rub a potato on your skin and it heals your warts or something. That's folk magic. That's folk superstition. Um, this is more like a rigid scientific attempt to decode the universe and sort of get back to the Greek Roman philosophers like Aristotle and these people thousands of years ago who were trying to unlock the geometry and the the secrets of the universe. That's what these guys are trying to do now in this Catholic Protestant age of conflict and confusion. Uh, so it's not surprising that much that, you know, somebody would fall for this thing about the Zohar, think that it's an ancient text, and then end up believing that there's this, this uh, new religion that needs to come by eventually and transcend all normal religions, uh, Muslim, Jewish, Christian. So after this mother Zuana died, Postel believed that her soul entered his body and possessed him. Now, if it, she was possessed by a demon, it's very possible that he was literally possessed by a demon. And, you know, I would kind of believe it. Because what did this mystical mother Zuana prophetess cause him to do next when it entered him and possessed him. Want to take any guesses? I don't think you're going to guess it. He traveled to Rome to meet Ignatius Loyola. This is a, a British scholar who believed in the Zohar and on paper has no connection, no connection whatsoever to Ignatius Loyola, the Jesuits, Los Alambrados, Spain, but when prophetess Zuana, Ma mother Zuana, enters him, thinks it's the Shekinah, there's this Zohar rhetoric, possesses him after she dies, he decides that the thing he needs to do most, out of all the things you could do, is to go to Rome and talk to Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. Are you kidding me? I found that out by reading this book. 
this book doesn't even try to put any emphasis on that. The connection to Ignatius Loyola and the Jesuits is just a footnote. It just so happens that when explaining the history, the known history of John Dee's mentor, this Postel guy, that's just one of the interesting stories in his life. Yeah, he went to Rome. He met Ignatius Loyola. He did that after this crazy thing with prophetess Mother Zuana and this Kabbalah mysticism. And they just sort of skim over it and keep going. But I noticed it. And uh, what are the odds? What are the odds? It's almost like Ignatius Loyola had extreme demonic power. That's why the Borgia family came to become his slaves. Um, it's why the Pope granted him unlimited power out of the blue. And now a British intellectual who worships a prophetess who says that she has the Shekinah spirit and thinks that he possessed her, she possessed him, he goes, has to meet Ignatius Loyola. That's his next mission. He wanted to become one of the leaders of the Jesuits. So this is like right when it was brand new, 1540-ish. And he wanted to make sure that the Jesuits would fulfill their role as being a Zohar-inspired, Kabbalah-following global elite that would lead the world to the New Age, the post-Christian world religion, the fulfillment of the revelation. And Ignatius Loyola supposedly investigated him for heresy because Ignatius Loyola had power at that point. And this guy seemed crazy. He was coming up and saying he believed this and that. And supposedly, I don't really believe this, he, you know, rejected his attempt to join. And he investigated him for heresy. Well, obviously, at the time, England was uh, Anglican. They were Protestant. And the loyalties were very suspicious looking. So could Ignatius Loyola afford to graft in this British intellectual and uh, give him a position in the leadership of the Jesuits, whose entire purpose was to be counter-reformation? No, of course not. It would be ridiculous to include Postel in his group. So he sends him away, but I don't believe he actually rejects him. Postel discovered the Book of Enoch while he was in Rome, uh, some early version of it, of course, maybe not the same as we have it today, we don't know, but the Book of Enoch. And he went and met with the Pope and tried to convince the Pope how important the Book of Enoch was. So obviously here Postel is, again, falling for these, uh, these hoaxes, these Jewish mysticism books, and uh, wants the Catholic Church to embrace just like he went to Jesuits to try to influence them, he goes to the Pope and tries to tell him about the Book of Enoch. And, uh, you know, he wanted to tell him how important the Zohar was. So clearly, the Zohar, Los Alumbrados, mysticism, uh, had already gotten to England. Then after that stuff in Rome, uh, he met up with John Dee again in France, is what they say. And that's where the Inquisition, or maybe it was afterwards, but anyway, it, it's kind of a rough history given. But the Inquisition in investigated Postel, and they found him not evil, but mad, meaning crazy, and they imprisoned him. So you could imagine that the Inquisition is taking it easy on him, and... Uh, Normally, they would kill somebody, put them on trial, execute them if they were a danger. But this guy, they just claimed he was crazy. Now, what are the odds of that? Because they killed all these innocent Christians who just said, I want to, I don't want to be baptized as, I don't want to baptize my babies and I want to worship Jesus. They get tortured and killed and burned at the stake and everything. But this guy who talks about the Zohar and a new religion and the book of Enoch and all these things, he gets just let off the hook and just imprisoned for a little while because they do crazy. Again, this sort of speaks to me of favoritism because they weren't really against him. They just had to show some sort of 
indication that he was uh, not approved of, but they had him in mind. And they might have even questioned him more while he was in prison and learned, you know, what he knew and what he thought was going to happen. That would make sense. So, John D. is his mentor. Obviously, John D. would have asked him about all these things, figured out all these things, directly mentoring him. He, John D. picked up these beliefs. What did John D. himself promote? John D. swore loyalty to both the Catholic and Protestant English queens at that time in his lifetime, Bloody Mary, the Catholic, and Queen Elizabeth, the Protestant. So he didn't have any loyalty. You know, he was an intellectual, didn't care which side. He swore to one another that he would be loyal to them and their side. He wanted to be famous. He wanted to be a world-changing person. Obviously, he believed in this stuff that his mentor believed in. He wanted to have enough power to change the world. So uh, we know that eventually, by towards the end of his life, he claims that he was part of a secret brotherhood of mystics. And I believe that's Los Alambrados because all the signs point towards this Zohar-inspired Kabbalah thing. He has to go to meet Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola, we talked about last time, has this connection with uh, Los Alambrados. And he was even investigated by the Inquisition for it. So, you know, he's part of this Brotherhood of Mystics, John D. is. John D. claimed and was known as a sorcerer back then. That was just basically the same as being a scientist. You're trying to do alchemy. You know, you're trying to do scientific experiments. Um, he was a sorcerer, and he claimed to discover the universal key of knowledge. That's what John D. claimed, that he could understand all the mysteries of the heavenly realm and earthly realm with this weird formula he came up with. And back then, it's like the invention of ciphers and secret codes, and uh, people were writing their, their philosophical discoveries in ways that nobody else could understand unless you had this key to unlock the knowledge and understand it. And he thought he had the ultimate key to understand the universe. Very much a Los Alambrados idea, if you think about it because they believed that they could unite with God and transcend materialism and all of these things, and that their sins didn't even count as sins because God was doing it through them. So, um, John Dee taught that divine illumination could be achieved by ceremonial magic and understanding Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, much like his mentor. He was obsessed with the work of Raymond Lull, who is also known as Dr. Illuminatus. Interesting name, huh? Divine Illumination. Zohar means light. It means illumination. Los Alambrados means light. It means illumination. Lucifer is the light bringer. We talked about that last time. Now here's Dr. Illuminatus. Before the Illuminati existed, by the way. So this is not a reference to the group Illuminati. This is something else, which is more about the, like I said, the Zohar, which means shining light. John Dee believed humanity could artificially engineer the end of the world and return and the return of Christ by fulfilling prophecy and convinced Queen Elizabeth of this. That's where the story really, that's where he really makes a difference in the world because the British monarchy, it's not just an academic now in little secret societies here and there, it's the official British monarchy getting in on this idea and buying into the idea. Queen Elizabeth wanted him to do astrology, wanted him to do sorcery, to get an advantage over Spain and France and stuff. So... John Dee spent his late years contacting angels. That's what the book explains, is this uh, visions he had, the Enochian magic, the Kabbalah magic, and documenting the visions that they had. So he thought he had a direct connection to angels. Now, angel is just a generic term for a divine being or a spiritual 
being that has some authority or power. So in that sense, he might be right, because what we call demons are not a separate like category than angels. Demons and angels are not, you know, red forked tail uh, uh, imps and these holy, beautiful uh, people that have blonde hair and blue eyes and wings. They're all spiritual beings that we can't see. And so you could be talking to a demon and think you're talking to an angel. And uh, that's exactly what seems to have happened here. England's secret goal became to conquer America. America was discovered. It was being controlled by France and Spain. They were fighting over it. Uh, that's where you have Louisiana and, you know, the Spanish uh, colonies there and stuff. And eventually, uh, England wanted to usher in the reestablishment of Israel, uh, a global conflict against Israel, because that's in Revelation, and then the return of the Messiah. They wanted to create the conditions for that. They believed that the new world, America, was going to be key in being able to do that. John D. called America, uh, was it the new Atlantis? Um, tried to convince Queen Elizabeth that she was the reincarnation of King Arthur. He believed that he himself, John D., was the reincarnation of Merlin the wizard. And so he filled up their heads with this nonsense in order to try to get the the Zohar uh, prophecy side to get off the ground, to, to fill their head with these dreams of world conquest. Freemasonry and other secret societies were created or taken over. Like Freemasonry existed in some form as actual masons who built buildings of stone did have guilds. There were such a thing as masons and Freemasons were ones who could go around and find a job anywhere and so on and so forth. But Freemasonry as a secret society uh, was basically invented by Los Alambrados and their spin-off groups like the Jesuits in order to help achieve that goal of his from as many angles as possible. So England became central in creating secret societies that would have long-lasting international influence without officially acknowledging them as part of the British plan, the Queen Elizabeth plan to uh, take over the, the reins of world power, have this international society working with science and alchemy and scientific discoveries and technology and mapping and navigation and all of these things. Uh, which brings us to the Rosicrucians. Here's Wikipedia. Okay, so this isn't... Uh, this isn't me making anything up. Rosicrucianism is a spiritual cultural movement that arose in Europe in the 17th century. So that's the 1600s. This is the aftermath of John D. John D. said he was part of a brotherhood. Well, that brotherhood obviously went on and kept doing things. Um, so they published texts. They announced their existence to the world, but they claim to be ancient. So they're built on esoteric truths of the ancient past, they say, just like the Zohar, claimed that it was written in the second century in a cave and it was passed down through Adam and Moses and all these things. It's the secrets of the ancient history. But really, it was written in the 1200s by Jews and conversos who wanted to, you know, create more importance for themselves in the Middle Ages and the, the debate that was happening in the Catholic Church. So, same thing here. The Rosicrucians claim, just like the Freemasons, that they come from ancient orders. But it's all, every time you see that, it's a reference back to the Zohar and the Kabbalah, which is not ancient. I mean, it's old by our standards because it's hundreds of years old by now, but uh, it's not ancient at that time. It's actually fairly new. So they say it was concealed from the average man, provide insight into nature, the physical universe, the spiritual realm, exact same thing that the Zohar does. Uh, and 
they it says it com clearly combines references to Kabbalah, Hermeticism, alchemy, there's John D, and Christian mysticism, also Jesuits. So you have Los Alambrados, Christian mysticism, alchemy, Hermeticism, Kabbalah, all packaged in to Rosicrucianism. The Rosicrucian Manifesto heralded a universal reformation of mankind. Well, where did we hear that? Just barely. That's John D. That's the Zohar. That's Postel, his mentor, saying there's going to be a universal new religion that's going to transcend all of mankind. And it's going to be the Enlightenment, just like the Los Alambrados wanted. Um, so you can see down here in his work, Silentium Post Clamoris, uh, 1617. That's how early this was. This is like 10 years after John Dee's dead. The Rosicrucian Michael Meyer described Rosic Rosicrucianism as having arisen in it from a primordial tra tradition. That's how primordial, just like the beginning of mankind. And he says, our origins are Egyptian Brahman, Brahmanic, derived from mysteries of Eleusis and uh, Samothrace, Magi of Persia, Pythor uh, Pythagoreans, and the Arabs. So they don't, notice they don't say Jews and uh, whatever, you know, Second Temple Judaism, but all the other things, Egypt, Brahma, um, Persia, so that's Babylon. Um, they're claiming to have that tradition. Now, in reality, they don't. It's, it's a fraud. It's a hoax to get Europeans in the 1600s to believe that they are discovering the ancient secrets of history, which is a very seductive thing to believe that suddenly a man, the same thing could happen today. You believe that there's still people today who are obsessed with Kabbalah and the 32 pads and all these lies that come from the Zohar hoax. That's Rosicrucianism, and it, it's a very real thing you can look up in Wikipedia. Uh, let's, it, it keeps talking about it. They promised a spiritual transformation at a time of great turmoil. Well, that's happened many times, so the promise can always be, you know, World War One and Two. There you go. Uh, you know, the Thirty Years' War of of uh, the 1600s. The all these times, and of course, the end of the world being the ultimate transformation of spirituality in the time of great turmoil there. It's again, it's John Dee's mission codified into a secret society that he claimed he was a brotherhood, part of that brotherhood. And then it says it was influential on Freemasonry. So Rosicrucianism had a big influence on Freemasonry, especially as it was emerging in Scotland. So there you have Scottish Rite Freemasonry, which is the main one that people talk about, coming from Rosicrucianism, and Rosicrucianism comes from the John D. School of Thought, the brotherhood that he was part of, the international... I'm not going to make it sound like he created it, don't get me wrong. It's that he was... He, just like Postel, went to go to talk to Ignatius Loyola, and there's this thing between France and Spain and, and uh, the intellectuals of that Europe at that time that there would have been that conversos Luciferian cult that was already there. It could go by any number of names. But John Dee was the one that really grounded it in Scotland, in England, in... Great Britain, and uh, Scotland is obviously part of, of Great Britain, and that's where, you know, it, it comes into the English-speaking world that we're familiar, familiar with. In later centuries, many esoteric societies claim to be derived from the original Rosicrucians, um, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. Here we have the British occultist, so British occultist, Aleister Crowley. And if you know anything about occultism, modern occultism, Aleister Crowley is basically the modern equivalent to John Dee. You know, trying to uncover all the mysteries, contacting demons, uh, 
laying out this prophecy of the future and trying to upset and destroy Christianity through his mysticism, his occultism. That's Rosicrucianism. The Rosicrucian Enlightenment I found this interesting. During the 17th century, so the 1600s, these manifestos that they were circulating in Europe declared the existence of a secret brotherhood, there you go, John D. of alchemists and sages who were preparing to transform the arts and sciences and religion, political and intellectual landscapes of Europe. And boy, did they. Wars of politics and religion ravaged the continent. The works were reissued several times following numerous pamphlets, followed by numerous pamphlets, favorable or otherwise. Between 1614 and and 1620, about 400 manuscripts and books that we know about today were published, which discussed Rosicrucian documents. And then here we have a picture of one of them, um, which is Fama Fraternitatis Rose Crucis. Um, so it appears in Paris in 1622. Um, so this is this is capturing the imagination of Europe at a time when there's a lot of war and a lot of division between different Christian denominations. The wars of Protestant and Catholic are going strong right now. And in the background, you have intellectuals like John Dee, who, remember, promised his allegiance to both the Catholic and Protestant queens, so obviously he doesn't care. He's a good example that we could look at of somebody who transcends both sides because they don't actually care about Christianity. They're Luciferian, and they use both sides against each other. And meanwhile, they're trying to pump up their own idea of this secret brotherhood who's actually going to rule things and transform sciences, religion, politics, and intellectual landscapes. The Enlightenment, in other words. Legacy in Esoteric Orders, Rose Cross, Degrees in Freemasonry. The 18th degree is called the Knight of the Rose Cross. Here's a picture of their symbol, the 18th degree, from the Scottish Rite. And I showed you this slide last time. If you look here, the 18th degree is indeed, has that same exact symbol, and is called the Knight of the Rose Cross. This is a real thing. Freemasons today, because there's Freemasons exist today. That nobody denies that. Uh, anyone who's 18th degree is a Knight of the Rose Cross. So they directly acknowledge their roots as Rosicrucianism. And you can clearly see how the 1600s was influenced in this secret brotherhood of mystics by John D, which is English. It's British. Here you have the Scottish Rite, Freemasonry. Here you have the Knight of the Rose Cross. Just cement those connections in your brain. And then obviously Postel, who's John Dee's mentor, goes to Ignatius Loyola and has that suspicious event there. And the Book of Enoch and the Catholic Church he's trying to get in. I mean, this is not a stretch. So by engineering horrific war between Catholics and Protestants, Secret societies wanted, the Rosicrucians, for example, and Freemasons, wanted European nobility to accept that Christian religion was evil, or at least foolish. Instead, philosophical secret orders should rule behind closed doors and focus on science, alchemy, and the art of hidden power. So this is what that secret brotherhood is about. They want to transform the landscape. The Enlightenment is not about getting you the average person, to reject God. The Enlightenment is about getting the intellectual class, the nobility, back when there was real nobility, you really had dukes and duchesses and, you know, princes and all of these different ranks. Um, and they were the ones they wanted to influence. So they would be, have their area, they'd be these landowners, they would be deeply interested in the economics and politics of Europe and where the opportunities were to make money and all these things and the wars obviously that were happening and as they're 
you know, they're in their court. They don't actually work. They're just, you know, nobles. So they go around and spend all their time talking and making arrangements and arranging weddings and having kids and all these things. And, you know, as you're doing that, you're like, okay, well, you know, have you heard about the Rosie Cross? Have you heard about, you know, the secret order of mystics? They're, they're apparently, they're transforming the world. They're, they're making these discoveries. And meanwhile, there's all this war, and you're thinking, well, why, why do we have all this senseless death and conflict in the Christian religion? We should just have this enlightenment instead. I want to be part of that order. I could imagine somebody like myself very easily getting involved in something like that if I was alive at that time, because I would want to know these mysteries, and I would have to be, you know, initiated into that secret society, and then who knows where it leads and stuff. So back here, we didn't really have conspiracy theories either, because it was just emerging at the time. So one of these wars is the Thirty Years War, from 1618, 10 years after John Dee dies, to 1648. And I'm not saying this war wouldn't have happened Otherwise, these these there's a lot of things going on in these wars. It's not like, a, you know, John D. could just dictate the war shall happen and then it happens. But every time a war does happen, uh, you can have people fueling the fire who are part of this brotherhood and then wanting to lead humanity into and fellow nobles and royals, royals into believing that it's time to give up on Christianity altogether and just go to the Enlightenment. Here you see, from Wikipedia, the statistics estimated for that war was 4,500,000 to 8 million people dead from that war. 8 million at a time when we the world population was much smaller than it is today. So, devastating absolutely devastating this is a catholic protestant war for territory and who's going to control which area we're not going to get into the history of it because it's deliberately nonsensical and uh every everybody's lying about their reasons for why they did it because nobody wanted to look like the bad guy but the point is that the uh rosicrucians and these secret brotherhood they sure seem very wise by comparison you you see, 1618, that's when, uh, 1614 is when this publication of the Rosy Cross is there. So between 1614 and 1620, 400 manuscripts and books were written about the Rosicrucians. And here, in that exact time frame, you have the Thirty Years' War. So it goes hand in hand. Uh, these things seem like they're totally separate, but actually there's this underlying connection. Eight million people killed or dead from disease and war and meanwhile this rosy cross order is there trying to convince people they're going to transform society and help them get out of this conflict at a time of great crisis where did they say that um promising a spiritual transformation at a time of great turmoil so 30 years war is pretty much a great turmoil eight million people dying and they want to have a spiritual transformation of atheism, of Luciferianism, of rejecting real Christianity, or not that the Catholic or Anglican or Lutheran were really biblical, but they want people to give up on the idea altogether. So that's the Rosicrucians and the connection with John Dee and uh, this secret brotherhood. Then we get the Bavarian Illuminati in 1776. So this is, you know... Uh, over a hundred years later. The Illuminati is a name given to several groups, both real and fictitious. Historically, the name refers to the Bavarian Illuminati, the Enlightenment era se secret society founded in 1776 in Bavaria, today part of Germany. So by the time you fast forward a hundred years, the Rosicrucians have been doing a lot of work. We're in the Enlightenment age, thanks to them. They are undermining traditional religion. They are turning people against both the Catholic Church and the Anglicans and the, uh, the Protestants. And here we go with the Illuminati, a direct callback to Los Alambrados. 
but it's in Germany. And it says that the society's goals were to oppose superstition, by which they mean all spiritual religion, obscuritanism, uh, obscurin, obscurantism, religious influence over public life. So they just want to have a secular world uh, with no religious authority and abuses of state power. So they want to undermine the sovereignty of kings and nobles and royalty as well. They want to have, guess what, French Revolution. Down there, you can see at the bottom of the page here, the Illuminati continued underground were responsible for the French Revolution. Um, you know, they were accused of that by, by the nobility who was getting killed by the French Revolution. They're like, yeah, we know who's behind this. It's, it's this Illuminati. Um, so... You can say, uh, here you go. The Illuminati, along with Freemasonry and other secret societies, were outlawed through edict by Charles Theodore, elector of Bavaria. And so they were outlawed. You couldn't prove who was part of it. It's a secret society. It was founded by Adam Weishaupt, though. Uh, that is a known fact. And let's look at Adam Weishaupt. Who is he? Well, he was a Jesuit. Uh, here's the Wikipedia entry on Adam Weishaupt. He was educated at a Jesuit school. And after Pope Clement's suppression of the Society of Jesus in 1773, Weishaupt became a professor of canon law which was a position held exclusively by the Jesuits until that time. So what are the odds that this guy who uh, wants to found this secret society, obviously he didn't just come up with the idea on the day and say, I'm going to create a secret society, and he created the same day, right? These things have a history in their personal lives and in their philosophies leading up to that point. So a guy who wants to have no more superstitions, no more religious influence over public life. He goes and joins, after getting educated by Jesuits, he joins a university position that was always held by Jesuits until that time. Professor of canon law. Hmm. In 1775, Weishaupt was introduced to the empirical philosophy of Johann George Heinrich Fedor, um, so three years after the Jesuits are banished and not allowed to exist anymore, this guy goes and creates the Illuminati. I believe Weishaupt claimed to oppose the Jesuits, but his function was to continue the Luciferian movement under a new disguise. Obviously, if the Jesuits aren't allowed to exist, they have to do something else. They didn't vanish into thin air. They just took off their black robes, stopped calling themselves Jesuits, and became Illuminati. Because their roots are in Los Alumbrados anyway, and Illuminati is just a reference to Alumbrados. So why bother with, they don't need the pretense of Christianity. It actually holds them back. They can do more with just the term Illuminati or Los Alumbrados. They didn't want to be the Society of Jesus. They were forced to. By, by the Inquisition and by the fact that the Catholic Church was putting them in a tough spot. So now when they're banished altogether, okay, we'll just stop calling ourselves Jesuits and we'll become Illuminati and we'll get Adam Weishaupt to uh, be our, our, uh, our founder of our society here. And then he goes, and the number one thing that the Illuminati hates is the Jesuits. What are the odds of that, right? So he's an anti-Jesuit on paper, officially. And he wants no religious influence anywhere, but he's doing exactly what the Jesuits were engineering, the Alambratus were engineering, the Rosicrucians were engineering. The Illuminati was officially founded by three, three years later, uh, after the Jesuits were abolished by the Pope and forbidden to exist. Why did the Pope abolish the Jesuits in 1773? 
They'd become too powerful. Every government in the world was watching them too closely for plots against them. Portugal, France, and Spain, the three biggest colonizers of the New World, had already fought against them and banished them from their territories. There's even movies about this, uh, like The Mission with Robert De Niro. And, uh, yeah, so they were already weakening. They were being controversial. Um, in 1605, they tried to blow up British Parliament and kill everyone to try to uh, eliminate the Protestants from it because they hated King James. They hated uh, the King James Bible. So they went in got banished because they were too controversial and they just slip right into Illuminati. So with John Dee's top level influence and the growth of Rosicrucianism and illuminated Freemasonry, which is what it's called the Scottish Rite Freemasonry, when you get high enough level, you become illuminated and that's when you are basically given entry into the Illuminati. If you make it that far, if they let you get that far, Britain gained the advantage of international spies, pirates, and science. Because uh, high seas, piracy, and all that was very important. Navigation, spice trade, routes, uh, you know, international trade was done through the ocean. And Britain gained world power by doing exactly that, by conquering the seas and becoming this naval power. Now, I want you to notice this, because this is kind of the final big connection. Under the patronage of the Russian society, there's a story behind that that doesn't matter, Jesuit provinces were effectively reconstituted in the Kingdom of Britain in 1803. So the Illuminati is 1776. Um, the Jesuits were banished in 1773. So like 30 years later... Um, the Kingdom of Great Britain gave patronage to the Jesuits, helped them out, let them reconstitute. And so what do you think the Jesuits do when they get a big favor from their friends there in Britain? Well, 10 years later, you have Britain's imperial century. Between 1815 and 1914, that's a hundred years, all the way up to World War I, 1914, a period referred to as Britain's imperial century by some historians, you had Pax Britannica, which is the same term that was used and applied to the Roman Empire, Pax Romana, where the, they have so much power that no one even tries to make war with them. Uh, that's why it's Pax. Pax means peace. Peace Britannica, peace of the British Empire, so powerful you can't stop them, can't even fight them. So, and it says down here, British imperial strength was underpinned by the steamship and the telegraph. New technologies invented in the second half of the 19th century, the 1800s. So you have this secret group of Rosicrucians, Illuminati, Los Alambrados, Jesuits, Mystics, Secret Brotherhood, John D., whatever you want to call them, they are Luciferian, they want technology, they want alchemy, they want science, and they vow to create and transform the world through technology and discoveries, scientific discoveries, occult discoveries, talking to angels, making inventions, they want progress in technology. They believe they're rediscovering ancient secrets from the ancient world. And sure enough, Britain embraces this because of Queen Elizabeth, because of their proxy groups and the Rosicrucians and Freemasonry. So they get to siphon all this knowledge and technology from all over Europe because they keep recruiting the smartest people into, this, uh, into these societies, and then it filters up to... Britain, and they have the money and the ability to uh, deploy these things before other people can. And they give help to the Jesuits, reconstitute in 1803, and that's basically, I believe, the, the final piece where the Jesuits get behind 
British world supremacy and they don't have to use because Britain was, you know, by reconstituting them, they're giving them a, a place to officially operate. And so they uh, establish universities there. They speed up this whole thing. They stop opposing Britain. Uh, you know, it says victory over Napoleon. So Napoleon is a Jesuit puppet. We can get into that separately. But Napoleon was, the only reason why Napoleon had any power was because the Jesuits were feeding him information and giving him advanced information all over the place. Of course, it's the victory over Napoleon that leads to the Rothschilds and the Waterloo situation, which Britain gets transformed. That's not a coincidence either. Um, and yeah, that's when this new technology comes out, allows Britain to have a hundred years of prosperity. So they rewarded Britain by giving them the keys to the world, reuniting John Dee's prophetic vision with the power of Jesuits and Los Alambrados, which is a mighty power. The great British Empire, the hundred years of that great British Empire only collapses with World War I and World War II, but in reality, Britain only gained greater control at that point thanks to World War I and II, because they financially and politically united with the U USA, with America, and created the United Nations. Britain conquered Palestine and gave Palestine to the United Nations so that the United Nations could go and create Israel. And USA was finally roped in, thanks to Pearl Harbor and these things, into becoming an international player, giving their finance and their banking systems to Britain, this international global order, the British Empire. But it's all done now secretly. British seems to be declining. The British Empire declares itself to be collapsed. But uh, we could get into next time how, if we wanted to, uh, we can do a follow-up lecture on H.G. Wells and Cecil Rhodes and these guys who actually keep the British Empire going through their own scheming of making it look like the British Empire is collapsing when in reality it's just engineering more proxy. Like I say here, we have been living in the secret proxy phase of the British Empire and John Dee's Zohar-inspired mission to fulfill Revelation ever since. In order to fulfill the prophecy of the world turning against Israel before the Messiah returns, this Atlantic powers conspiracy, Atlantic powers being the East Coast, especially of America and Britain. Um, and then Britain has the Commonwealth of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, all these places where Britain controlled. That's why World War II involved all of them coming into Europe, even though we shouldn't have, uh, because we had to go support Britain because it was the the Queen, the Britain. We had to go save the homeland. And so, uh, you know, with that, the United Nations, the Atlantic powers, you have this conspiracy to create anti-Semitic hatred against real Jews. Real Jews don't have power. There's an anti-Semitic conspiracy to create hatred against real Jews by having these dramatic controversies surrounding Israel that are supposed to be discovered by seekers of truth. So if you're a guy like me who goes and researches all these things, they want a guy like me to go and hate the Jews by discovering these secret controversies all over the place. And they sort of plant it just below the surface and the media covers it up in a very suspicious way. And you hear these people let things slip all the time that they're supposed to, you're supposed to find this trail. And because it's not officially acknowledged, you're supposed to think that it must be really true. Well, that's the same script that was really happening with the Jesuits and Otto von Bismarck in Germany and the culture comp and the fact that, you know, uh, Germany was exposing the Jesuits over and over again in the 1800s, late 1800s. I should have included slides for this stuff, but um, I'll just tell you, you know, 
before World War I, Germany was like the biggest enemy of the Jesuits ever. And sure enough, what happened in World War I and II, Germany got completely destroyed. Uh, its entire history erased. Nobody even knows what Prussia is. And uh, you forget all about the Jesuits. They disappear from history. And instead, there's just this German hatred of Jews and Jews running the world is what they say. And, you know, you have the Holocaust, you have this uh, tragedies, the creation of Israel, and that's history as far as anyone today knows. You don't know anything about Jesuits, you don't know anything about Otto von Bismarck, you don't know anything about Prussia, you don't know anything about Rosicrucians, Freemasons, Illuminati, uh, and this history that Britain had of interfering, having the secret technology, none of that. So hoaxes such as the Protocols of Zion, which were actually written by the Jesuits, caused Americans to fear and hate Jews, like Henry Ford. He read the Protocols of Zion, and he decided to fund anti-Jewish things. He was horribly anti-Jewish. He wrote a book, Henry Ford wrote a book called The International Jew the world's foremost danger or some, something like that. I don't remember the exact title. So Henry Ford was this hugely anti-Semitic person, the creator of Ford trucks and cars. Um, so he's this American industrialist who falls for this propaganda of the Protocols of Zion. And that's perfect for the Jesuits because they can keep creating more Jewish hatred and then what do they do? They're fulfilling that prophecy that the world is going to turn against Israel. That's the John D. prophecy, that eventually Israel has to be the center of a world uh, battle. And they're trying to trigger Armageddon. So um, they cause Americans to fear and hate Jews while forgetting about the Jesuits entirely. George Washington and Abe Lincoln hated the Jesuits. They didn't pretend that Jews had power. Jews were merchants. They traveled around. They were making deals, of course, trying to survive and help their people. But they didn't have this conspiratorial power. The Rothschild conspiracy theory, the banking system and all that is based off of Waterloo, the fall of Napoleon, which is the Jesuits. Jesuits were invited into England at that time. England, for some reason, allowed this Rothschild's to go and buy up the entire British Empire all at once. They didn't charge them with fraud. They didn't do anything against them. They just allow it to happen. Then they go and conquer Palestine and hand it right over to Israel with no compensation just because they, they love Jews so much. I mean, it's such an absurd story. That doesn't make any sense why Britain would do these things and allow those things to happen. Unless you believe either completely in this Jewish conspiracy that you, nobody knows how it existed before the 1800s uh, because there was no indication that Jews had power before then. Only the Jesuits did. And the, the Rosicrucians and these people who are inspired by uh, Zohar... But that's not the same as saying that just, you know, ordinary Jews were involved in anything. Um, so this narrative is based on all of that, that suspicion. And Jesuits know the history of the conversos. They, the Catholic Church knows very well that they forced Jews to convert to Catholicism and intermarry and lose their Jewish identity. But the Zohar is about trying to create a religion that transcends all of that. And so the scapegoat is the Jews. Um, you know, like I said, this was prophesied in Revelation as the synagogue of Satan. And people use the synagogue of Satan to say the Jews are running the world and that they're evil. But it literally says that the synagogue of Satan are people who are not Jews, non-Jews who say they are Jews and are lying about it. 
So Jews are actually the one group that cannot possibly be the synagogue of Satan because it's declared to be an imposter group. Non-Jewish secret society members who pretend to be Jews in order to turn Christians against Jews and vice versa. In reality, Christians should love Jews, show them the truth of Scripture, and expose the satanic conspiracy alongside them because just like how Satan wants to control Christianity through the Catholic Church and corrupting the Catholic Church and making sure that it it kills innocent Christians and it has the... Uh, you know, it's impossible to reform. It, it always just keeps getting worse. They want to do the same thing with Judaism. They want to make sure that Jews have corrupt leadership. They want to make sure that real Jews who are innocent and don't have power are always led by fake Jews, the synagogue of Satan, controlled by Jesuits, in order to perpetuate this prophecy that they eventually want to have happen of all the world turning against Israel. So that's the big picture of how all of this ties back in to John D. And uh, ultimately, even before that, the Zohar. And before that, obviously, um, you have just the Luciferian uh, cults throughout the ages, the mysticism. But this attempt of Satan to control Judaism, um, to make Jews hate Christians and Christians hate Jews, that's what Satan wants, and he's using these different groups to try to orchestrate that. And, uh, yeah. So we could go a lot further on that. We could go into H.G. Wells and, and these other writers who talked about their plan to, um, how, how to sustain British power without people realizing it. Um, and... I don't know if I'm going to do a lecture on that, but I appreciate you watching. Um, here's my book. You can buy it on all of these sites. We're getting great reviews and a lot of sales recently, so I appreciate it. Again, I want to remind you that uh, I'm not an expert. This is just my personal speculation. It's uh, my religious beliefs, and I can change them if I want to. This is speculation that I have on these complex things. So. Uh, thank you for watching, and uh, yeah, stay tuned for more lectures down the road.